Hello and welcome to the Link Interviews, the transatlantic update on the future of work. My name is Esther Ligand, head of KIT Link based at Karlsruhe's Institute of Technology. KIT Link is the strong bond between the German Southwest and the Silicon Valley. We established a transatlantic interview series where we discuss what we can learn from each other in order to build bridges for innovation between California and Germany. Today, we will hear about what challenges we are facing for both sides of the Atlantic. So far in the interviews, education has been the powerful strength for Germany. We will discuss on how things need to change towards why Silicon Valley attracts talents and why it's so successful. That leads us to new opportunities and challenges in education and entrepreneurship. With our catering interviews, we reflect the power of Silicon Valley and German collaboration, university industry relationships, unique mindsets, communication strength, and an open network. We create opportunities for exchange beyond the scope of universities. Greetings coming now from Jens Horstmann, entrepreneur and investor. After that, enjoy our talk with Matthias Hohensee and the series. Hello everyone, this is Jens, coming to you this time from our kitchen, the place, as we say in Silicon Valley, the best ideas are born, together with bright minds, a wonderful meal and friends. One of those friends is most certainly Matthias Hohensee, who has been in Silicon Valley for 23 years as the broad chief of Wirtschaftswoche. He provides us with tremendous perspective and has helped not only me, but many others to look outside the box, to see the bigger picture, to look across the Atlantic. One of the topics he's particularly passionate about is education. And within education, he has recently joined a startup to make a very dry subject in math or mathematics more attractive, more engaging for students. I can't wait to hear his interview. And like many others in this KIT Link series, um, such as Helvarian, who we recently heard, I'm sure Matthias will bring great perspective uh, to the series. So without further ado, welcome Matthias, enjoy. So welcome everyone to the KIT Link interview series, Embracing Change. Now, just as a reminder, we'll have a Q&A um, after the interview. So if you'd like to ask a question of our guests, please just type it into the chat on the YouTube. Um, so today we'll be talking with Matthias Hohenze about Silicon Valley's meaning for Europe. Matthias Hohenze is the Silicon Valley Bureau Chief and columnist for Germany's largest business weekly magazine, Wirtschaftswoche. He's been living and working in Silicon Valley for over 20 years and has interviewed notable founders and CEOs such as Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, Bill Gates, and Steve Wozniak, just to name a few. He's also the Georg von Holzbrink Award winner for excellence in business journalism. Thank you, Matthias, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our interview. Yeah, likewise. And just to start us off, um, I know that you wanted to give us a little bit of background information, a little bit of context first. And I know you've prepared a bit of a presentation for us. Yeah, that's true, uh, Francesca. So let me start the presentation. I thought it would be a good way to, to give some, some uh, to set the stage and give some points uh, for the debate and further Q&A. So let me see how to do it in Zoom. Um, uh, Okay. Perfect. And I'll hand it over to you then. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Francesca. Okay. Uh, so, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, good. Perfect. Okay. So, thank you very much. Good, good evening uh, to, to Germany. Thanks for the audience uh, for joining. Uh, so, I just wanted to give a, a short overview of what, what Silicon Valley is and uh, uh, to set the stage for our uh, discussion. So it's an area south of San Francisco and uh, many people consider San Francisco part of it. Some, uh, <clears throat> some San Franciscans uh, take offense in that, but it's not a geographic term anyway. So the geographic term is Bay Area. And the name Silicon Valley was invented by a journalist in the beginning of the 70s because of the many semiconductor companies the area had attracted. 
Nowadays, much more, you would have to add software valley or internet valley or even biotech uh, valley. And uh, even, every seven to 10 years, you have a, a soul searching in Silicon Valley and stories being made about an exodus of people leaving the region that happens in the 80s and the 90s after the dot-com uh, bubble and the financial crisis. And uh, some argue it happens now with people leaving San Francisco in particular. But uh, I can assure you they are coming back and every time something similar happened, uh, Silicon Valley came not only back, but became even more powerful. So what is unique about Silicon Valley? What can we learn from it? Well, I would argue that even though that it is part of the United States and of course, California, it is not the typical America. Why? Because almost 40% of the population is foreign born. The average in the state is only 14%. Uh, two thirds of the engineers in Silicon Valley were born outside the United States. And there are estimates that at least half of the Silicon Valley companies have a foreign born founder or co-founder. Uh, the most famous examples are eBay with Pierre Omedia, who was born in Paris, Google, of course, with Sergey Brin, born in Moscow, Konstantin Gericke, the co-founder of LinkedIn is from Germany, Jensen Huang, the founder of NVIDIA, the new Steve Jobs, some people call him, was born in Taiwan. And of course, the most famous at the moment, uh, Elon Musk, who grew up in South Africa. So I, I make that point because I would argue that Silicon Valley would be impossible without that very international population. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the things that makes Silicon Valley so successful, the ability to attract talent from all over the world and get them to work together. So over the last 20 years, I've seen many delegations of politicians, academics, and entrepreneurs who came to the area to learn about the secrets of Silicon Valley. And the most popular question is, of course, uh, how can we replicate Silicon Valley? Is there a blueprint? And as a matter of fact, there actually is one. So... That was one, two. So that is basically uh, the framework. And I admit it's very simplified, but in the end it works because uh, there are three pillars or clusters that are related to each other. So kind of a, a three a factor. So the first cluster consists of world-class universities that attract talent from the States and from all over the world. And most famous is certainly Stanford University. You have Berkeley as well, you have UCSF and Santa Clara University. All of them not only educate, but they also conduct research and promote entrepreneurship. So for instance, uh, Stanford University has an entity called the Stanford Office of Technology Licensing. It has been around for more than 30 years and its purpose is to evaluate inventions at Stanford for their commercial uh, viability to help students and staff to patent them and license them if necessary. The office is currently led by Karin Immerkluck. Uh, I think she is a Swiss national and has a PhD in molecular uh, genetics. So these technology transfer offices are very commonplace in the States. Uh, not all of them are so successful and well run as the one in Stanford. So it's, it's not a magic bullet, uh, but at least there is an entity that is responsible to help to commercialize inventions at universities. And I think that we would need more of that in Germany. So the second important cluster in Silicon Valley or pillar is capital. So right next to, to Stanford, there is Menlo Park, which has a la world largest concentration of venture capital companies, especially on Central Road. Um, this is a cluster which funds a lot of ideas and startups. And of course they are connected with universities uh, as well. Uh, so not only large venture capital companies like Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia, uh, but also a cluster of so-called business angels, retired business people or entrepreneurs. 
Some of them have their own entities like Kairezzo Forum, which is very active in seed money and first rounds. And it is not only about capital, it's also about connections and experience. And I will explain that later on how that works. So the third, third uh, important cluster are technology companies. Uh, to be precise, their willingness to work with young companies if they have convincing products or ideas. Often those companies invest as well or even acquire startups, uh, which provides venture capitalists with the ability to have an exit from their investment, which is very important to them. And famous uh, are the acquisitions of Instagram or WhatsApp by Facebook, or all the companies that Google has acquired, often in the form of so-called equi-hire to get the talents. And of course, not all that is positive. I admit that there is a debate that is, uh, if uh, that leads to monocultures and there are even government plans to forbid certain acquisitions by market leading companies. Uh, the point I want to make uh, is, and I think that is uh, important for Germany as well, is the willingness of established companies to work with young startups. So it's basically part of their research and development and also of their DNA. And I think Germany is lacking in that regard and we have to change that. So that all sounds very theoretical. So just let me give you a, a famous example. In um, 1995, I, I think uh, two PhD students uh, named Larry Page and Sergey Prien met at Stanford. Now we know them, all, uh, nowadays we know them. And in January 1996, they started a research project uh, to develop a new kind of search engine that also analyzed the relationships among websites to rank them better that came to the attention of the Office of Technology Licensing that I have just mentioned, as well as David Sheraton, uh, a professor of computer science at Stanford. So David is Canadian and I had the opportunity to interview him at this uh, very small office at Stanford and learn from him who it, uh, what it, how it happened. Uh, he is retired now, but uh, at that time he was for sure the wealthiest professor at Stanford a billionaire, even though you would never guess it by his demeanor and his modesty. So David liked Sergei and Larry, uh, most of all their product, and he made an introduction to his business partner and friend, Andy Bechtholzheim, who I think Jens knows very well. And uh, Andy, whom I have also interviewed over the years several times, agreed to give uh, them the first $100,000 to start their company. Andy, who is German, also had started a famous company years ago while at Stanford called Sun Microsystems. So that was the beginning of Google and the company later got money from Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, so the second pillar, capital. But even more important in 2000, uh, Yahoo, which was a large internet company uh, back then, uh, nowadays young people are not even aware of Yahoo anymore. So they decided to outsource their search engine. So why that would be a topic for another talk. Uh, but, but anyway, so Michael Moritz from Kleiner Perkins, who is from the UK and is a former journalist, uh, was on the board of Yahoo because he was one of their first outside investors. And he told me that he made the introduction to Google. So I talked to him about it later and he told me of course that he abstained from the vote but so Yahoo voted to give their search engine to Google. So it was a major breakthrough for Google, which put them on the map and a colossal mistake of Yahoo, which it realized two years later when it was already too late. I think that is one of the greatest story here in Silicon Valley I have seen. And Google is a perfect example of how the blueprint of Silicon Valley works in my opinion. So is there a secret formula uh, to success in Silicon Valley? Uh, yes, so I have tried to, to put it down here on this slide. It's very easy. It's just discover an idea, create a company, and then most important, scale it, make it big, very big. So we have a lot of ideas in Europe, but what often 
is lacking uh, is the funds to scale it, to make it really big. And in my opinion, that is why we don't have a Google or Amazon in, in, in Europe or in Germany. It is also due to the mindset of uh, German investors. So Iad Madisch, so the co-founder of ResearchGate, the Berlin-based social network for scientists, told me once that the attitude completely changed when he got Silicon Valley investors on board. Suddenly it was not about to get, a prof to, get to profitability as soon as possible, but it was to grow as fast as possible in order to establish itself in the market. And also one slogan here in the Valley, very famous, is to break rules and deal with the consequences later. So Google did not ask for permission to crawl websites. Uber did not apply for a taxi license. Airbnb did not apply for a hotel license. Of course, this is controversial, but at least it helps companies to get traction. Also, a lot of companies here start with a minimum viable product. In Germany, entrepreneurs, and I think uh, Jens made a point out of it in this talk he gave uh, recently, often overthink and make things too complicated. So I don't encourage uh, sloppiness, don't get me wrong, but I think uh, we should show more flexibility. So just, uh, Francesca, so just uh, three more slides. So one I wanted to show shortly is uh, the growing amount of capital that is available for the creation and the scaling of new companies in the States. Uh, and it's even more with all the investment vehicles like special acquisition purpose companies we are seeing right now that are looking for takeover targets. So there are billions of dollars out there and uh, more than one third of that capital goes to Silicon Valley, almost half to California. Here is a slide with uh, the numbers from last year from Pitchbrook and uh, you can see Silicon Valley is, uh, is first uh, and then uh, in far distance uh, New York is following and then uh, Los Angeles. So Los Angeles and Silicon Valley both in California. So this is still California, even though doing business has become harder to, to do it here in California, it's still, still very attractive. So the good news that we have gotten better in Europe, um, and that is a slide uh, from uh, the European venture capital spending in billion euro over the years. And the black number you see on top is the spending in Germany. So in 2020, we had 45 uh, billion euro in Europe and 6.3 billion of that in, in, in Germany, which I, I think is an is a achievement. So, okay. Um, in conclusion, um, there is a blueprint from Silicon Valley we can use, albeit in a, in a very different way. Uh, the key for me are three things, uh, getting and retaining talent, foster the technology transfer, and most of all, get bigger companies to work with startups. Uh, I think that is better than giving just money to large companies for certain projects. Also to, to change the mindset about entrepreneurship, make it more attractive uh, for young companies to work for them. So that was it. Uh, I hope that was not too much, uh, Francesca. I'm stopping the sharing right now and we are back. Yes, I think that was fantastic and a really uh, great overview. And a lot of questions have come up just even from that overview. Um, there are so many things I want to ask you about. But um, before we kind of dive into more specifics, I just would love to hear a bit about what you have seen over the last 20 years or so, because you've been in Silicon Valley for a long time and obviously reporting for a German publication. So you've been really watching both sides of the Atlantic here. I'm just wondering what kind of changes you've seen, things that you have noticed. Yeah, in, in short, a lot. <laughs> so uh, Silicon Valley is all about disruption. And uh, so when I came here, the idea was that I would stay like, three to five years in Silicon Valley, and then it's, it's very hard to, to, to leave California, not because the weather is so nice and the sun is shining on so many days, 
but also because of that disruption we are seeing here. So all the ideas and I started my, my career at the local newspaper and can, can still remember, especially during summer months. So we had to fill our pages uh, and had to look for, for, for topics, uh, sometimes very desperately. And here it's, it's, it's uh, the contrary. So I really have to select uh, what to report on and to whom to talk because there is so much going on. So what has changed over the last 20 years? Um, so when I left uh, Germany in 1998, uh, so the founding of companies with outside capital was rather the exception in, in Germany. Uh, we had some uh, great young companies as well, so Procard or, or Telebuch, which was later acquired by Amazon, but getting funding was very difficult. And uh, so I, I was familiar with that as well. So I started at Wirtschaftswoche in 1996 and, and I did the reporting about young uh, internet companies back then. So that has changed in Germany. Uh, so with seed founding and uh, round A uh, capital, uh, but getting further financing is still a struggle in Germany. And some entrepreneurs actually have to go to Silicon Valley. So one example is Jörg uh, Lambrecht from Detron. I think he is from, uh, from Braunschweig. Uh, I'm not sure, so he's from Northern Germany. The company is still there, but he has an office in Silicon Valley and he really struggled to get money in, 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 in Germany. And here in Silicon Valley, so I think over the course of three days, he had several term sheets. So term sheets, that's uh, the offer venture capitalists give you. And he is now successful with his company here in, 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 in Silicon Valley. Um, so in terms of what, such, what, what has changed here in the States, um, there's even more money. I mean, it's unbelievable how much money is out there, even more than during the first dot-com uh, uh, bubble. And the mindset has also changed a little bit. So some entrepreneurs now question their work, what they do and what the impact is on society. So I'm not sure if that is uh, lip service sometimes, uh, uh, but uh, I, I would argue there is a major thinking going on and uh, uh, there are more companies that try to make a social impact. Uh, uh, for instance, like Salesforce that is donating a share of their profit to, uh, uh, for, for, for good causes and for edu education. But uh, yeah, so that, that, yeah, I hope that answers your questions, uh, Francesca. Yeah, absolutely. And have you seen the relationship between, let's say, Germany and the U.S., this transatlantic relationship? Have you seen that change over the past 20 years? Yeah, so I think some, some, some uh, just about the mindset in, in Germany, I think some attitudes in Germany uh, have not changed. Uh, so unlike Americans, uh, and you know that Francesca, uh, Germans are not usually not very well versed in presentation skills. Or, or networking and uh, Americans usually they think bigger, they think worldwide, even though it might sound preposterous at times, they are not shy at setting big goals. And um, in terms of networking here in the States, what I have observed is uh, it is very natural for entrepreneurs uh, to share ideas and help each other uh, to a small degree, even if they could be competitors. And uh, the thinking is, uh, I'm going to help you and maybe you can return the favor. And in Germany, and at least that is my observation over the years, and it might have gone li gotten a little bit better, but there is still a fear among entrepreneurs that the other person might steal my idea. So, um, and, and networking is also, I mean, it has gotten better, but not like here in the States. Uh, so just an example, a friend of mine, uh, Günther Wopser, who owns and manages Lauda, which is a world market leader in temperature control. And so it's a typical German Mittelstand company. So he spent a year in Silicon Valley with his family just uh, to learn more about uh, how innovation works here. And he even wrote a book about that that I can recommend. And he returned two years ago to, to Germany and try to do networking in this home region of Würzburg. And I think he describes that in his book. And 
So uh, when he, he told me that when he attended a local get together hosted by the local chamber of Commer commerce in, in Würzburg, he tried to do networking the American style. So just approaching people he didn't know. And uh, so Francesca, you can imagine that that <laughs> did not go very well. So people looked at him like he was from Mars. So, so what do you want from me? So that's uh, 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 a cultural uh, difference. Uh, and also um, just to make that point, I think the, the image of entrepreneurs in Germany is not very good. Uh, despite the success of the so-called Wirtschaftswunder and the famous German Mittelstand, it is more like in the public, okay, there is this person who wants to strike it rich by exploiting others and hardly ever is job creation and new ideas mentioned. And I myself, as a German, I call it German envy which is deeply rooted in German culture. It is very different here in the States. Uh, I, I, I may simplify, and you know it better than me, Francesca, but uh, at least in my observation here, people value the role of entrepreneurs and investors. And it's, it's not about envy. It's more like, oh, if that person can achieve that, maybe I could also do that. And that's, I think, it's a, it's a major cultural difference. And uh, the other point is, I think Germans are also more risk adverse as, as, as Germans. And I can even understand why. I mean, in Germany, if you fail, it's like a personal stigma. So it's very hard to recover. And of course, in the state, nobody sets out to fail. Uh, to, to, to fail. But, uh, but uh, if, you, if you fail, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not good, but uh, you get a second or maybe a third chance here in Silicon Valley, uh, especially when it is clear that it was not your mistake, that it was due to circumstances and that you learned. Um, and um, so maybe it will work next time. And, and as a result, what we see in Germany is that many, many young Germans uh, for instance, also in my family, um, join the government rather than, or well-established companies, uh, rather than start, start their own company. And that was even the lesson of Corona in, in Germany. So it seems that it was better to work for the government or a big company. And I think that could really haunt us for years. Mm. I think this is, um you bring up such a, a good point about the, the difference in mindset and how that really influences things. But what do you think is needed to, to change the mindset? What things could be in place in order to, to make that shift? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, uh, Francesca. And um, I really thought long and hard about it. So, but in the end, I think uh, it's like Bill Clinton said, so that famous, it's uh, economy is stupid. You could say, or I would claim, it's the education stupid. <laughs> so um, I, I'm a really, really big believer, and, and Jens mentioned that in the beginning, in education. So in, in Germany, we don't have many mineral resources. Uh, what we have is great aspiration. What we have is talent. And we have the opportunity, and we do that, uh, to provide uh, an education. And I think uh, that's, uh, that's a game changer. Um, the biggest advantage in our system is that uh, the fact that it is, most of us, it's still free. So it's provided by the taxpayer. And in the end, uh, when you graduate, you don't have students loans up the wazoo like you have here in the United States. Uh, so I, I, for instance, I talked to Sebastian Thrun, who is German as well. So he's uh, the father or considered the father of the self-driving car. And he taught as a professor in, at Stanford. And he is, all, uh, he is a pioneer in education. So he founded that online university's Audacity. And so Sebastian, uh, I, I asked him the same question you, you were asking me, Francesca. And he said uh, that education is still one of the biggest assets we have in Germany. I mean, we may not have those well-known universities like Stanford, Harvard, or Princeton, but in general, the, the quality of the system, despite all criticisms, criticisms of what, what we see during Corona now, is, 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 is good, is still good. Um, 
the question is, can we make more of it? And I think we have to. And I think that should start early on in school. So getting more education, how to take care of your financial situation. And perhaps we can also convey uh, a better image of entrepreneurs, that it is not only about making money or striking it rich, but also about creating new products and most of all creating jobs and opportunities. I mean, that, that would really help in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like adding those ideas of innovation and entrepreneurship earlier into the educational system might help shift that mindset a bit. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And what about for the U.S.? I mean, we know right now we're talking about this, the German mindset and how that can hinder um, sort of innovation in this direction. But what about the American mindset when it comes to this playing field as well? Um, yeah, I think so. Um... It is often said that uh, Germans, they strive to be the, the world champions in social responsibility, uh, making the world better. And uh, some call that naive, and maybe it is. Uh, um, but, but I think here in, in, in America, and, and I think it's, it's changing a little bit right now, um, I guess it would be good if Americans would have uh, a greater sense of social responsibility like we, we have in Germany. So, and that uh, comes to education as well. So for instance, one of my neighbors here just down the street, Gary, he is a staunch cons conservative uh, Republican. And I, I like Gary, so we have a lot of discussions, uh, but uh, his, uh, he thinks that uh, everybody should pay for the education. And he argues that uh, why should someone without a university education should pay for the education of others? And uh, to his credit, I mean, he has three children in university <laughs> and supports him. So it's very expensive for him, but he can afford it. So he's an entrepreneur. Um, and I argued with him a lot uh, that it would be better for society if everybody who has talent uh, but cannot afford the education gets one without student loans. And his answer was that, uh, yeah, that's why we have scholarships. So, uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, Gary, so I, I don't know if he's listening in. When he's listening in, he's very generous. <laughs> but it is this uh, deep uh, belief that everybody should earn uh, their way and pay for it without uh, exceptions. And again, I'm a great believer in that education should be free. And we have agreed, Gary and I have agreed to disagree. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really amazing point as well because um, education is so, higher education, let's yeah. put it that way, it's so expensive in America. It has some of the best, of course, educational institutions in the world, but it, it really is only a limited opportunity. So not everybody can take advantage of it. So absolutely, I, I would say that that resonates. Um, so just going back to, this idea of the sort of relationship, trans, transatlantic relationship. What's the appeal or the advantages for Silicon Valley to seek out partners in Germany and, and vice versa? Yeah, so American ventures capitalists, capitalists are already uh, investing heavily in Germany. So I talked to several of them years ago. I think it all started in 2013 when I talked to David Bloomberg who uh, started to invest in Germany because the valuation was much better. Uh, the only thing was he told me, well, I expected to see a lot of uh, engineering startup, but startups, but it was, was more uh, uh, e-commerce startups. And the reason was because the Samba brothers in, in Germany had such a big uh, impact and were more focused on, 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 on dot-com and that had, uh, has uh, on, on e-commerce. So that, that has definitely changed. And, uh, um, uh, and I, I met with some very high net worth uh, individuals in the past that wanted to expand to Silicon Valley and uh, saw just the fact that they had money uh, would give them access here in, in, in Silicon Valley. And that's not the case. I mean, there's plenty of money here. Uh, what people are interested in uh, uh, the, is actually access to ideas, to talents and maybe companies. So uh, 
to, to have access to, to a network in Germany. And a lot of them are actually looking over to Europe and uh, try to establish outposts there as well. And I think that that could work both ways and it already does. Yeah. I think this idea of networking has come up um, before when you were talking about the cultural differences also in, in networking. And maybe what kind of advice or insight could you offer, let's say, to Germans who want to network in America and Americans who want to network in Germany? Yeah, Americans who want to network in Germany, I think it's just uh, be more direct <laughs> what you want. I mean, you know it, Francesca, it's uh, the American way, so you, you never address something uh, uh, direct, so you are very polite. And I have learned uh, over the years that in, in, if something is very interesting, it means that it's actually not very interesting. So I, I guess uh, that so those cultural differences, uh, uh, it, it would, would help to keep that in mind. Uh, networking in, 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 in Silicon Valley is actually very easy if you're open to it. Uh, so that's what I have learned in Silicon Valley. You can actually get into that network. It is not exclusive here. Uh, one example is a, a, a good friend of mine, Martin Mikos. Um, so he's Finnish. Uh, so Finns are not well known for being very uh, open or doing a lot of, <laughs> of networking. So Martin is different. So he came here, um, uh, I don't know, was 2003 or so, 2002 to Silicon Valley uh, to establish MySQL here in Silicon Valley, an outpost for them. And so like half a year later, so everybody knew Martin. He was at every conference, he talked to everybody. So he was at every cocktail hour and uh, talked people up. And then uh, like a year later or so, he sold my SQL to Oracle for a billion dollars. So, um, so the, 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 the message is you can make it here in Silicon Valley. Uh, you just have to be open and you have to do network, networking. So another, Example is, uh, and I think he is a graduate from Karlsruhe Un University, is uh, Syria Gröding, who is a really a great entrepreneur. So he is working on a new idea for the detection of cancer and new therapies for cancer, even though he has a background in, in e-commerce. Uh, so he had a startup in, uh, it was about local advertising before that he sold for $250 million. And he's now working on this really great company, which is trying to find biomarkers for cancer in a natural way. Mm -hmm. And Syria, he is somebody who he, he knows everybody, not, not even in Silicon Valley, but all over the States. And when I did a story about his startup, so he made intros to, I think, three Nobel Prize winner, the founder of Moderna. And so, and he sent out an email and like half an hour later, all of them answered and replied. So I was very impressed with that. So he is a consummate networker in Silicon Valley. So you can, you can achieve it even if you are from Germany. Yeah, I, I like how you, you mentioned that really it's not about the, the money that is most interesting. It's about the networks. Who can you connect people with? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that sounds really interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you know, what kind of cooperations have you seen between the US and Germany and what has worked and not worked? What has been successful and, and why? Yeah, I, I think the, the relationship between Germany and the United States has frayed a little bit over, over the years, but it is still very strong. And there's a lot of exchange uh, between the countries. Uh, so one of the, the the, the industry I cover is the automotive industry. And uh, a lot of German car manufacturers have invested in factories in the United States. Uh, so mostly on the, on the East Coast. Uh, uh, but they have research labs here in Silicon Valley going back 20 years. And uh, even the self-driving car is, so wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible without the participation of Volkswagen. So they supplied the, the, the Touareg and they, they supplied money for Sebastian to, 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 to start the, the project uh, so, uh, 15 or 16 years ago. And um, so the 
manufacturers from Germany. So I think they're doing a better job just to tap into local talent here in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, um, I think that's, that's a good example how, how it can work on, on, on both sides. So I know that Volkswagen, for instance, is uh, just uh, expanding a new campus in Seattle and they're hiring a lot of uh, German, uh, of American programmers and, and talent. And they can because uh, the image has changed a little bit of Volkswagen over the years. I mean, you know, it was not the best with the diesel scandal and all, but that has changed. And then the other example is, of course, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, he is a big fan of Germany. He has tons of, uh, of German entrepreneurs at, at Tesla from Audi or BMW or Daimler. And he has decided to, to build his first European plant in, in, in Germany. So I'm not sure if he, re he regrets it now <laughs> with, with all the, the problems he's having in, in Grünheide. But I think that's a, a great example that it can actually work both ways, that it's not a zero sum, sum game. I mean, we have innovation on both sides of the Atlantic. And if we work together, even if we are competitors, I mean, great, great things can happen. Yeah, and I think that's uh, what you just said is so important that, you know, there are really so many good things on both sides um, of this transatlantic bridge. And so where do you see German, the future for German and American collaboration or the possibilities for that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very important, uh, the, the cooperation between Germany and the United States. Uh, uh, we have to make sure that we fight protectionism and agree on international standards. And I think that's very, very important because now we see a more and more fragmented internet that we have uh, like a Chinese internet, we have an American internet or Western internet. And I think that's, that's, that, that could be dangerous for the, for the further innovation. And uh, one example is also the, the booming field of artificial intelligence. So how do we make sure that we get the benefits out of artificial intelligence and also how to avoid the, the dangers or the pitfalls of uh, artificial intelligence. And I think that the EU is just working on a framework. And I think that's something that the United States needs, uh, even though, even with privacy, I mean, we often ridicule a little bit what, what Europe is doing in that regard. On the other hand, it has led to changes here in the, in the States as well. So it's initiatives from, from, from Europe or also, uh, biotechnology, for instance, I mean, all this, with what we have seen with, with this Corona. I mean, uh, if you look at the so-called gain of function research, so the manipul manipulation of viruses, um, so that was outlawed in the United States. And then instead of stopping it, it was outsourced to China. And also in that lab in Wuhan, they did that. And I think there should be agreements to not to do that and or at least put more regulations on it or put sanctions on it. And I think uh, the US and Germany and also China, we shouldn't forget, forget China. Uh, they, they should work on that instead of looking the other way. Hmm. Really good points there. And um, is there anything that you see that we need to do now to make make kind of the road for future collaborations happen besides the things that you have just mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, to the point I, I, I made uh, so earlier is to invest into, into education and perhaps work with American universities as well. Uh, so look at the uh, offices of technology licensing, what can we learn and as I said, it's not a magic bullet, so not, not everything is well run as a one in, in Stanford, but maybe we can uh, take the best experience and lessons and also apply them in Germany. And uh, yeah, invest more in education. And I, I don't mean education in a classical way. So it uh, should include the opportunity to learning by doing it yourself. So maybe you don't have a PhD, but you have shown that you actually have talent and uh, acquired a lot of knowledge uh, yourself. 
So just my personal example, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dropout from university. So, which is now it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's popular here in Silicon Valley. And I'm still grateful to my, to Stefan Baron, which was my first editor at Wirtschaftswoche, uh, that did not care about that back then. So uh, back then, that was in 1996, uh, when you applied at Wirtschaftswoche, you were expected to have several university degrees or even a PhD. So my advantage back then was that I was already successful as a freelance journalist uh, covering the so very exotic internet economy. And uh, so, and I think we should care less about formalities and just give people opportunities, even though they don't have uh, sometimes a formal education for that. Um, I think that was so well put, <laughs> careless about formalities, right? And more about opportunities, which is fantastic. I just wanted to say um, thank you so much. I do want to, there are so many questions here for you that I do want to give us time to get to them. So I'm just gonna move on to the questions. But before we do, I just wanna ask you if there's anything else that you think is important to keep in mind that we, we haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, I think we, we, we covered almost everything. Um, so, but, but just a proposal or an idea. So maybe if we have a billionaire today in our audience, I don't know. Uh, so I, I think a great idea would be to, to set up a, a foundation in Germany and give money to high achievers uh, uh, that are maybe pre-selected by experts. Uh, so give them money, no strings attached, and uh, give them the, the goal to create a product, a service, a company, something like that. So, so don't be so formal. So that's, 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 that's my message. Uh, create, create more opportunities in Germany. And we have the talent. So for me, it's often heartbreaking. So I'm a business journalist for almost 30 years and uh, did a lot of technology stories and uh, especially most of them in Germany in the, in the 90s. And I've seen a lot of great innovations in Germany. And years later, I've seen the same in the United States, but it was commercialized. So it was ideas in Germany. And it really, sometimes it breaks my heart because I know we, we have, we have talent, we have good people, we have great people over there. And so Andy Bechtolzheim also told me that, he told me that uh, it's so sad that we in Germany missed out uh, during the, the, the internet revolution, uh, not only in job creation, but also in, in acquiring wealth, becoming prosperous and creating a, a new Mittelstand. Mm -hmm. well, just one last question before we get to the audience's questions. So what, what advice would you have to, let's say, some, some person who has that idea, who has that innovation, who has something they want to get off the ground? What advice do you have to them if they're located in Germany right now? So just to, to follow their ideas, follow their dreams. And uh, I know that sounds very simple and I know it is hard. It's really hard. It's hard to, 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 to get money in Germany to, to convince investors it's a little bit easier here in, 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 in the United States. And if you have a great idea, even though I, I don't like people leaving Germany, uh, see leaving Germany, uh, if you have a great idea that is, can be scaled and it's an international idea, you can always come to the, uh, to the United States and maybe you will go back one day. Uh, we have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs here. So for instance, from India, I think, uh, almost half of the companies here in, in, in Silicon Valley have an, an, an Indian founder or, or co-founder from, from, from India. And uh, several of them went back to India as well and gave money over there and, and, and working on, on, on infrastructure and on, on better uh, opportunities for people. So it can work both ways. When my advice uh, is uh, not to give up and also not to, Sometimes you have to listen to others, but, but often if you have a great idea and people are trying to talk you out of it, so um, you should con continue uh, because often those ideas that other people think that they would not work in the end work. And one example is, is, is Tesla or electric car. So I did a story very early on when actually nobody knew uh, Tesla back in 2005. 
with the original in, investor, uh, original uh, founder of uh, Tesla, which is not Elon Musk, but Martin Eberhardt. And he told me that he went to all venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. So only one would give him money and the other one who would give him, wanted to give him more money was Elon Musk. So everybody tried to talk him out of the idea. And uh, in the end, I mean, look at Tesla today. I mean, it's the uh, uh, most valuable car company in the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, if, if, I think this is a good moment um, before we turn to the questions, just to mention that these, uh, what you're talking about was going abroad, you know, going transatlantic to bring your ideas. I think sometimes people think that a bridge is one way, right? You cross the bridge and you never come back. But I don't think so. The bridge is really fluid, right? There's a lot of movement back and forth. Uh, it's about connecting people and not just about traveling to one side and ending up there. And that's what we're hoping to do here with KIT Link is to connect those two sides so that we can always be in exchange. Um, it's a very, very great initiative. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the right step. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I want to move on to the questions because people have a lot of them. So the first question is, um, how would you manage to change the education plan so drastically? It's not politically wanted to make it more about the economy, let's say. Um, yeah, we, we, so uh, I, I'm a journalist, so I'm not a politician, but uh, so I guess the more we, we talk about it, uh, the easier it should become that, to convince politicians. And <clears throat> I think politicians are already convinced about that. So I talked a lot <clears throat> to them, so when, those delegations came over here to Silicon Valley. I mean, even Angela Merkel, <clears throat> uh, or should, I, I should say Angela Merkel, <laughs> uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Merkel um, uh, visited uh, Silicon Valley and uh, also talked about education that was years ago. And uh, yeah, we, we should do more than lip service, especially now, like during Corona, we, we, we all, uh, saw how, how bad the infrastructure is in, in, in schools. Uh, I think the, the public has to demand it and we have to create more entrepreneurs giving good examples that uh, entrepreneurship is not about striking the rich, but about create products as well and, uh, and uh, <coughs> employing people. Um, so at, at Wirtschaftswoche, we also had initiatives over the years where we, we tried to do a magazine for, for students as well uh, and uh, try to, to, to get the idea of uh, education about entrepreneurship and financial, financial education into, into schools <clears throat> early on. And uh, it, it's hard, but I think we, we, we have to do it. And, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, now we have to, to look for new uh, ways to convey education to, 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 to get people, people's interest in education. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, and the next question is, is there a trend to move Texas due to much <laughs> bureaucracy in California or is Silicon Valley, Valley, Valley so sorry, if, or is Silicon Valley being challenged by other places like uh, Shenzhen? Uh, it is uh, inside the United States. Uh, 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 so that's why I, on one of my slides, I don't know if you saw it, there was a small asterisk next to Hewlett Packard and, and Oracle. And so I forgot to mention that, but the headquarters of Hewlett Packard uh, Enterprise is now in Houston. Uh, and uh, of Oracle, it's, it's in Austin. And I think that uh, Elon Musk is also preparing to move his company over the headquarters to, to Texas as well. So there's competition going on here in the States, which I think is actually a good thing because here in Valley, in, in Silicon Valley, it's just too much. I mean, you have, uh, I would argue that's actually uh, uh, an opportunity for, for Silicon Valley to, to keep growing and to keep innovating because it was just too much before Corona. So to get to San Francisco, uh, sometimes I had to, to leave my, my office here at six in the morning or five in the morning uh, to, just because of that, uh, that uh, huge traffic we have here, which is kind of ironic because in Silicon Valley, they are trying to, 
invents the future of transportation. Yes, as a whole re region here is a mess in terms of, of infrastructure and, uh, and, and travel. And of course, there's a lot of competition from China. And uh, so if I would be young again, <laughs> like 20, I would actually go to China. Uh, um, that being said, uh, I think uh, Silicon Valley is still the place to be where a lot of in innovation and ideas are coming around and the, the, the stories about the exodus of Silicon Valley, it's overblown. So people are already moving back to Silicon Valley, they're moving back to San Francisco. There's going to be like a hybrid uh, approach that they can spend more time in, uh, at home, like uh, two days uh, at home and three days in the office. So I think we're gonna see more innovation in, in Silicon Valley. And I hope that we're also going to see more innovation from Europe. Mm -hmm. So in your, in your opinion, the move from, for entrepreneurs to go to Texas is not necessarily about bureaucracy or costs or what do you it's, think? Yeah, yeah Francesca, it's, it's, it's about uh, uh, cost mainly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, Texas doesn't have a, a state income tax like California has, and for high earner it's, it's already 13.4% in California, and there are talks about so even increasing that, uh, so that's one of the reasons, uh, so the Oracle, for instance, decided to go to, to Texas and, and, and Tesla as well. And then, of course, uh, Austin. I mean, I don't know if you have been to Austin, Francesca. It's a really nice city. It's uh, cultural. Uh, it's a lot of entertainment as well. It's like a mini Silicon Valley, uh, already very liberal. So it's it's like a little bit like San Francisco, even though it is in, in Texas, uh, which is not known for being very liberal. But um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an opportunity uh, to start something new. There's also, it's not so bureaucratic like here in, 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 in California. And also in, in, in Austin, you can still buy a house uh, for, I don't know, 600 or 700,000 uh, dollars, which is a lot, but here in Silicon Valley, you would have to spend like two or three million dollars uh, to get just a, a decent, uh, a home in, in Palo Alto or in, in Menlo Park. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, so that's one, one of the reasons uh, people are branching out to, to other states as well. And with, with that in mind, is there already an area in Germany that is on, on route to become a Silicon Valley replica, in your opinion? Yeah, I think there are several ones. Uh, so Berlin, for instance, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a hub in, in Germany. Hamburg as well, uh, Munich, uh, uh, I hope Baden-Württemberg, so my, my wife is from Freiburg, uh, so, and I plan to go back <laughs> to Freiburg one day, uh, uh, is going to be a center as well, and maybe uh, Kit uh, can, can, can work on, on that, and uh, so Karlsruhe University, that's like the MIT of Germany in my mind. So I hope that there are going to be more companies uh, in Baden-Württemberg as well, and I'm, I'm happy to support that. <laughs> mm. um, I'm going to give one last question because we're, we're almost at time here. And the last question I'll give is, do you think Germany or Europe should try to focus on software companies like, like Silicon Valley, or should they use Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley blueprint to focus their special specialities um, like engineering? Yeah, I think you have to do both because I think nothing can be done without software. So like Mark Andreessen said, like over 10 years ago, uh, he said like software is eating the world and that is still true. It's like a, a new law, like Morse law. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, software is very important. Uh, fortunately, we, we have uh, as, at least SAP in, in, in Germany. I think that's... Uh, one of the last holdouts in, in Germany, and we have to do more in, in terms of, of, of software and programming. That being said, I think that uh, the blueprint can be used for, for other uh, areas as well. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a keen believer in biotechnology and medicine and medicine startups and artificial intelligence, which is also connected, of course, to software, it's, it's software. 
um, is is uh, we we have create, create great talents in, in in Germany as well, and we could use the Silicon Valley blueprint to 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 get ahead in that uh, competition, and we have to. Because uh, if we look at just the sheer amount of money that is not only invested in the United States, but also in China. So we haven't talked about China. So in, in the end, what we have to avoid is that we have that big superpowers, um, uh, USA and China, and then we are somewhere in the middle. And so we have to, to struggle to, to protect our talent, to protect our IP. And that is a situation we have to avoid. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that, that's, I think, a really important note that we can end on. I just want to say thank you so much, Matthias, for speaking with us today. It's been great. Thank you, Francesca. Very good question. So it was a pleasure talking to you. Well, we hope that maybe sometime you can come back and uh, fill us in on the next, the next chapter. Yeah, yeah. After Corona, I already <laughs> I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> that needs to have that. That's an advantage here in the States. And I hope that we overcome that in, in Germany as well. Yeah, so do I. Um, I just want to take this closing note to say uh, thank you on the behalf of the KIT Link team to all of you, our viewers, for joining us today and being a part of this transatlantic bridge. So if you found this talk valuable and if you know someone who couldn't be here today but would find this talk interesting, please um, pass along the link. It will be on our website very shortly. And we will see you soon at the next talk. And have a wonderful day or evening, whichever side of the Atlantic you're on. And thank you again, Matthias. Thank you, Francesca. Take care, everyone. Okay.